All right. Well, it's an honor to have Bobby Connor back. How many have heard him before? Okay. Just about everyone. All right. Well, it's an honor to have him here uh, again. The Lord has used him and his wife all over the world. It's been a pleasure to get to know them through the years. And uh, we love your wife dearly um, and your whole family. But uh, we just want to honor him. So if you would stand and welcome him as he comes. What do you think? We got our we own? Okay, good. God bless you. Go ahead and be seated. What a day to be alive. The Bible said, This is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to what? Rejoice and be glad in it. Now, let, let me just tell you a little bit about yourself, okay? You are highly favored of God. I'm telling you, God is up to something in these days. The Bible says we're in the kingdom for such a time as this. Now, there's never been a time just like this. We're in perilous times. We're in very dangerous times. But in the middle of this, it says, we're in the kingdom for such a time as this. But there's something greater than that. What? The kingdom is in us for such a greater time than this. Isn't that something? Esther 4.14, in the kingdom for such a time as this. But the kingdom of God is in us. And boy, we're going to have to stand up and shine and be bold and brave and very courageous how many of you know we're really, really facing some problems? <laughs> but here's what we're going to do. We're going to do Isaiah 26.3. Isaiah 26.3 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. Trust in the Lord Jehovah, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting, never failing strength. Now, is there any power in peace? Keep your focus on him. Isaiah 26, 3, he'll keep us in perfect peace. Romans 16, 11. Ro Romans says, uh, Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will do something. What? Crush Satan under your feet shortly. So uh, we need peace, don't we? This means yes, unless you're in India. You know. uh, yeah. You ever been in India? Bombay that way? That way. I, I hadn't figured that out yet. Yes, just, but anyway, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. We love uh, the Pittmans. We love what's going on. And God is really up to something. Uh, I, the Bible tells, this, tells us this is one of the most crucial time in human history. It says, that knowing what a critical hour this is. How it is high time now for us to wake up out of our slumber. And it says in the book of, Re of Ro Romans, rouse to reality. If anybody on earth needs a reality check, it's the church. I'm telling you, uh, we, we got, it said rouse to reality because final salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed in, adhered to, and trusted in Christ the Messiah. And it said put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the lust of the flesh. I left, I left Texas today at 3 o'clock in the morning. like I never got here. Good gracious but uh, that's so. If I if I if I'm a blooper, it's because I got up early. Good <laughs> Lord, got there and the plane was five hours late. And they, they said, "Well, we can get you there at five. I said, "No, I'm not going to get there at five. I'm going to get there when I'm supposed to get there." But it all worked out. Aren't you glad that God's in charge? Yes. Aren't you glad God is not up there going? I never saw that coming. <laughs> hey, he's he's author and finisher. He's not author and oops. You ever started a project and oops? God ain't that away. Philippians, Philippians 1 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, he that hath begun a good work in us will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. So he's not going to drop us middle stream. He's going to see to it that we succeed. And it says, Did you read Jeremiah 29 11? I know my thoughts, I think, towards you, declares the Lord. Thoughts of your success, not your failure. My intention is to bring you to a good end, not some dismal demise. See, the devil will lie to you and say, well, you're so insignificant. God don't even think about you. He's lying to you. The Bible tells us that God thinks weighty, precious thoughts towards us. And that's a word for glorious. And it's Psalms 139. Uh, you, you ought to think about Psalms 139. I'm going to use it in two, two rams right here. Psalms 139, it says, all of our days were written in his book. Before we've ever lived a single one of them. 
So let me ask you, when did you decide to come to World Harvest Church? Somewhere back there in eternity past, <laughs> Almighty God picked up his pen and wrote that you'd be sitting in that chair. All of our days are written in his book before we've ever lived a single one of them. Psalms, 130, Psalms 139, verse 15 and 16. So he wrote it down. Back there in eternity past, they'll be sitting in a World Harvest Church. That, I, I get purpose out of that, don't you? All of our days are written in his book before we've ever lived a single one of them. Wow. I, and God does think about us. That next verse in that Psalms 139 says, God's thoughts charge us are weighty and precious. And it says those weighty and precious glorious thoughts that God has for us are more numerous than the sands on the seashore. So don't let the devil tell you that God doesn't think about you. He's constantly praying for you and thinking about you. Jesus ever lives to make what? Intercession for us. Aren't you glad Jesus loves us? Aren't you glad God's got a plan for us? Did you know what the Bible says? We're seated in heavenly places. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings. We got the best seat in the house. We're seated with Christ at the right hand of God. There's nothing in any universe more powerful than the right hand of God. That's what it says. You read that, didn't you? Psalms uh, 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 1611, you will show me the pathway of life in your presence, this fullness of joy. At your right hand, there's pleasures forevermore. You want to get happy, get at the right hand of God, okay? Pleasures. God wants you to enjoy yourself. Well, you know, you don't know what I'm going through. Hey, the key is through. Yea, though, walk through the valley. He's not going to leave us in the member Shadrach, Meshach, and other kid. God didn't leave them, and he won't leave you. Nahum 1, 7. Say it, Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. Here's what it says. You ready? It's my favorite verse in the whole Bible. God is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those that are trusting him. God is always good. Now, I like to walk around. I got more stuff than Captain Kangaroo here tonight. Good Lord. Oh, my wife, she said to Bobby, you need, because we, we, we have book tables and we, we uh, uh, write books and, they, and people come by and they say, which book do you think I should get? What's this book about? And she said, Bobby, carry some of the books to the, the podium and talk about them so the people know what they're about. Here's one. You ready? Yeah. Master's plan, divine design. God created things for you to do before he created you. That's what it says. Master's plan, divine design, discovering your divine destiny. You can do something no other human being on earth can do. You're divinely unique. Ephesians 2.10. I read Ephesians 2.10 out of every... I'm screaming. I read... <laughs> I'll get closer to you. I read Ephesians 2.10 out of every English translation I could find. Ephesians 2.10, here's what it says. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God pre-planned pre ahead of time. It literally is saying God created things for you to do before you were you. And so that's what we're talking about. Master's plan, divine design. You can do something for the kingdom of God and the purposes of God that no other person can do. Because you're divinely unique. You're one in seven point something billion. You ought to look to yourself in the mirror and go, wow, I'm really something. Ain't nobody like me. You're one of a kind. Aren't you glad? I'm glad. We're unique. Say unique. unique. All right. Master plan, divine design. What is his divine design for your life? He'll tell you. He'll guide you and lead you by the Holy Ghost, and you will know the will of God for your life. God would be unjust to give us a task without a touch, an assignment without an anointing. God wants to anoint us, doesn't he? Now, he has anointed us, and the same anointing that is in Jesus Christ was in, it will be in you. That's what Jesus said. I wouldn't believe it if it wasn't from Jesus. Like that beard. Yeah, man, look at that. Yeah. See that? Uh, yeah. Mine, mine uh, my wife lets me grow it out during hunting season. And so hunting season is just about to start. But mine goes just, it's rogue. <laughs> it looks like a walrus that's lost a tooth. You know, anyway, I, I like your beard. But let's talk about purpose in your life. You want to? God's got a plan, and God's got a good plan, and he's going to find somebody that will fulfill the will of God. 
And I like the fact that it says all of our days are written in his book before we've ever lived a single one of them. Uh, I, there's another verse that tells us how to get God to write your name in his book. Here it is. You ready? It's in here. I'll, I'll show it to you. It says, get a, if you want God to write your name in his book, get a bunch of your buddies together. Sit around and talk about how much you love Jesus. The Bible said God will take notice of it and write your name in his book. You go, what verse is that? Malachi 3.16. So get a bunch of your buddies together. Sit down and start talking about how much you love Jesus. God will take notice of it and he'll write your name in his book. Isn't that good? Yeah. I tell you. Listen. Okay, here we go. Define the define this design, master plan. You can do something nobody else can do. I like this. Here, here's a great verse. You ought to tack it. You ought to hang it on your refrigerator door. Y'all do that? Hang a note? Oh, sticky notes. Good Lord. I got them all over the house. Yeah. Here's your sticky note. Here it is. Psalms 84, 11. He is the sun and the shield. No good thing will the Lord withhold from those that are walking upright. He will give us present day favor, future glory, honor, splendor, and heavenly bliss. That's Psalms 84, 11. Isn't that cool? It's, a, it's there. You can see it. You can see that. Psalms 84, 11. Heavenly bliss. No good thing will the Lord withhold from those that are walking upright. I'm telling you guys, God doesn't want us to stagnate. The more of God you get, the more of God you know you need. I've never met anybody in their right mind that said, no thanks, got all the God I want. <laughs> the more you get, the more you understand, you barely have begun. Yeah. All throughout endless ages of eternity, that's going to be one of the blessings of heaven. He's going to begin to unfurl more of his majesty. It's not going to be like uh, Chevy Chase and Lampoon vacation. Y'all remember that? <laughs> when he, he run out there and he saw the Grand Canyon jump back in the station wagon and took off. That ain't how heaven's going to be. Heaven's going to be continual revelation of who God is. He's unfathomable. You'll never get to the end of him. Wow, aren't you glad? Listen, heaven's real. Hell's real. The Bible's real. Are you real? Yeah, we're really being called to go to a higher dimension. The Bible said, as we behold him with it, I'm screaming again. As as we behold him with an unveiled face, we're changed from one dimension of glory to the next. See, now I can see you. That's in the Bible. I can see you, but not very distinctly. Why? There's a veil in, in front of my eyes. It's my hand, but uh, as we behold him <laughs> with an unveiled face, we're changed from one dimension of glory to the next. I'm going to tell you what veil is over the church, keeping the church from seeing Jesus in his majesty. Guess what it is? You, you want to know? It's the only thing I've ever found in the Bible more powerful than the Bible. Tradition. Teaching for commandments the traditions of men and making the word of God of none effect. Listen, have you read the Bible? God don't like religion. I dare you to go home tonight and read Isaiah chapter 1 and come back here tomorrow and tell me God likes religion. Isaiah chapter 1 says, Away with your new moons and your Sabbaths and your holy convocations. They weary me. It says, I pour the sizzling of your fat. Like we need to throw God a barbecue. <laughs> now, yes, God set up the feast and the festivals to point to Jesus. But when you drop Jesus and hang on to the feast and the festivals, you got religion. Every woe, say every woe. Every woe that came out of the mouth of God was to the Pharisees, the religious hypocrites. They had their feasts and festivals, and they had nothing to do with Messiah. Boy, we better make sure we're not religious. I want relationship, don't you? Yeah. Not some kind of a ritual. All right, you doing okay? I got a lot of stuff to talk about. Here's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Uh, it says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be flooded with revelatory light. You will have a grasp and a comprehension of the ways of God. What? You can see further with these eyes than you can these. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be flooded with revelatory light. You will have a grasp and a comprehension of the ways of God. Okay, so master plan, divine design. We'll have a book sale back there after a while. You can come back there and you'll say, oh, I, I know that book. It tells me that I've got something I need to do for God. And God does have something for you to do. And that, that word I used over there, Ephesians 2, 2, 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. I looked up the word workmanship. Guess what it is? It's the final stroke of a master artist. 
So when the devil goes, who do you think you are? Go, I'm the best God could do. (laughs) That's what it says. You're the final stroke. I'm screaming. I don't care. I'm just going to scream and have a good time. Some people have just enough Jesus to be miserable. They got him in the head but not the heart. They got rules, regulations, stipulations, manipulations. God has nothing to do with that. I like that curly hair. What's your name? Looks like it's been cut with a weed eater. Hey! No, it looks great. First time my wife ever saw me, I shaved every hair off my head with a razor, put Vaseline on it, and I was riding an Indian motorcycle down a snow-covered road. She fell wildly in love with me. Yeah. That Indian motorcycle would be worth a ton of money now if I had it. Oh, boy. Now, I, I want you to start enjoying who you are. Well, you know, uh, no, here's one of the greatest gifts you can ever get. Be you yielded to him. Don't try to morph yourself into anybody else. Be you yielded to him. That's all God asks. You don't have to go, well, I want to be like her, him, and them. No, be you. The unique way you are, and that's the way God wants to use you, okay? Master plan, divine design. Here's the, I, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do it. My, my grandkids are teaching my wife how to what, stream. I used to get by with wearing anything I wanted to. <laughs> and then they showed her how to live stream. I get back to the hotel. I can't believe you wore that with them, you know. <laughs> it don't make a hoot to me, you know. But women are strange, aren't they? I've been married, oh, Lord, boy. But my wife is something. She, she's tough as a boot and got big old boys. The big old boys, they make the Duck Dynasty guys look clean shaven. My big old boys, are buff. they're rough. I used to travel all the time, man. And I'd come home, and I, had a, I got a big old king-size bed down there in Texas. I'd fall in the shower, and then I'd fall in bed. Here'd come the boys, big old beards. They'd jump in bed, kiss me all around the face, hug on me. Looked like a buffalo waller when we got out of there. Yeah. But I'll tell you what. Kids need passion, don't they? Yeah, see, I didn't have a daddy. My daddy died in a mental institution from a venereal disease, 37 years old. He's a living proof that there's a high cost for low living. And see, that, his sin almost cost me my life. This is 1943. The doctor said to my mother, the baby inside your belly will be afflicted with the same disease killing his father. So my mother was desperate. She already had uh, two children. One was born crippled, my brother. So she took a coat hanger, turned it into a hook, opened her wound, stuck the coat hanger in, and attempted to pull my life out. But here's what happened. So help me God, don't lie in church. Ask Ananias and Sapphira. Remember those guys feel dead for lying in church? Well, the coat hanger came in, and the hand of God, so help me God, pushed me aside, kept my mother from extracting my life out of, out of her body. She wasn't doing it out of meanness, but she's doing it out of mercy. She didn't want me to wither away like my father was. But see, God's got a plan. It says in the Bible, he covered me in my mother's womb. And I told my wife about it before my mother ever told me. My wife, Carolyn, said, ah, Bobby, nobody could know what happened to him when he's a fetus. I said, me and John the Baptist do. Remember him? Yeah. I'll I'll get to to some books and then. All right, here's one. Jesus appeared to me, Bobby, as close as you are right here. And he was sad, and he's not sad. The Bible said he's the happiest person ever lived on earth. He's an ornithol of gladness far above all his brothers. That's what it says. Happiest man ever lived with Jesus. And he appeared to me, and he was sad. He looked me straight in the eye, and here's what he said. Bobby? My people don't like to talk to me. The least attended service in any church is prayer meeting. And then he said with a twinkle in his eye, Jesus, he said, I'm going to give you a phrase, a statement that will turn the paradigm of prayer. It will turn it from a, a duty to a delight, from a drudgery to a desire. I said, Lord, I want it. I want to see the people of God hungry to pray. Running to the altar to pray. He said, you tell my people what true prayer is. Here's the phrase he gave me. You tell my people what true prayer is. True prayer is 
an audience with the king. No potentate on earth has ever given such an opportunity. Anytime, any place, anywhere, we can come in unashamedly and let our requests be made known unto God. Isn't that amazing? An audience with the king. And I'm telling you, 1 John 5, 14 said, This is the confidence we have in God. We ask him anything according to his word. We know he hears us. If we know he hears us, we're totally confident we're going to get what we're asking. <clears throat> I'll, give you a, I'll, give, I'll give you a Texas version of a, book, a verse in the Bible. You ready? Make up your mind what you want. Tell God what that is, and he'll get it for you. <laughs> what? <laughs> Here it is in, in the Bible. Job 22, 28. And you shall decide a thing. Make up your mind. Then you decree what you've decided. And the Lord will establish it. And the light of his favor will shine upon your pathway. Make up your mind what you want. Tell God what that is. And he'll get it for you. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me. I will answer you. I will show you what? Great and mighty things. It literally says things that are unaccessible until you pray them into accessibility. Prayer is powerful, isn't it? Yes, sir. Audience with the king. So I studied every verse I could find about prayer. It says pray without ceasing. And so you'll like it. Here, here's one, Charles Spurgeon. True prayer is neither a mere mental exercise or a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is a spiritual, spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. Talking to almighty God, the creator, anytime, any place. And it says we have his full attention. We can come what boldly to the throne. Aren't you glad? You try to barge into some boss's office. See, and he's the creator of the ends of the earth. And we can boldly come before him. You better learn about prayer. We've got, to, we've got to know more about how to connect with God. So that's Master's Plan, Divine Design. Audience with the King. Oh, this is David's mighty men. Dread champions. We got, we got too many weak warriors. Joshua 1.9. Well, I don't want to get that close to Joshua 1.8 without quoting that. Joshua 1.8 says... The words of the Bible will not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate upon them day and night, and they will guarantee you overwhelming success. I tell people, if you want to be a flop, stay out of the Bible. Because if you get in the Bible, you'll have overwhelming success. Joshua 1.8. The words of this book shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate upon them day and night. They'll guarantee you overwhelming success. But here's what we need to look at is Joshua 1.9. Be bold. Be brave. Be very courageous. Go do what you're called to do because you're not going by yourself. Who's going with you? Jeremiah 20, 11. Jeremiah 20, 11 said, The Lord is with me as a dread champion. I gave that to a man named Dr. Trump. Yeah. The Lord is with me as a dread champion. Therefore, my persecutors will not prevail. They will have eternal, never-ending shame. That's Jeremiah 20, 11. Mm -hmm. You better understand the Bible. It says, touch not my anointed and do my servants no harm. That ain't talking just about preachers. Uh, that, these lunatics we got running the country now, most of them should be in the penitentiary. I'm serious as I can be. We're in bad trouble. We're under a curse. What curse? The Bible says, woe unto the nation. Isaiah 520, woe unto the nation finds it easy to call good evil and evil good. That substitutes bitter for sweet. All right, Dread Champions. Okay, I'll give you this book, okay? It said, study the names of the, the great champions of God, and in their Hebrew name you'll find the character and the conduct I intend from an end time army to a suit, okay? Good, how you been? Me too, okay. <laughs> now, for listen, I'm going to tell you some stuff. And it, it's all true. For 29 years now, on the Day of Atonement, I have a visitation from Jesus Christ. He'll come tell me some of the things that's going to happen in the future. I write in a book called The Shepherd's Rod. And th this, is, this is the one for this year, 2023. We, we're in the process of getting 2024 printed. And I, I want to tell you about it. These are real. We prophesied about the pandemic. 
It says there's coming a deadly, devastating pandemic. Uh, and did one come? I said it'll be a shake-up for a wake-up to get the body of Christ to embrace a greater glory. And I'm telling you, uh, these shepherd's rod, you can go all the way back for 29 years. You say, well, how did you start riding the shepherd's rod? I had a friend named Bob Jones, very unique man. He'd go to heaven like we'd go to Walmart. That's true, Bob Jones. Had a, he had a third grade education from uh, uh, over there in uh, third grade education. The government checked him twice and he went off the genius chart. Bob Jones. I was in his house one time. And well, I was actually in a strawberry patch with him. And he was getting some strawberries. And he gets up from the ground. He, he goes, okay, I'm going in the house. I said, how come you go in the house? He said, a millionaire is going to call me. I said, who? He said, I don't know. I said, I'm going in the house with you. <laughs> so we got to the door. He took his little shoes off. They were muddy. And he took his uh, uh, Kansas City ball cap and hung it on a nail and walked by the phone. The phone rang. He picked it up again. Yeah, uh-huh. Hello. Yeah. This is Bob Jones. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, you're a man ahead of your time. They wouldn't buy what you built, but you've given your heart to the Lord, and he's got you out of all the trouble. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. All right. Bye. Click. I said, who was it? He said, I don't know, somebody named James DeLorean. The guy that made the Back to the Future car. Isn't that cool? I was in Bob Jones' house when NASA called him and said, tell us what you see. We know you can see further than us into the spirit, out into the universe. Bob Jones. Yeah, he's in heaven. Now, that, that's how I started writing Shepherd John. Bob, Bob had written them for all these decades, and they're very, very wonderful so um, 29 years ago, Bob, Bob came in there, and he goes, he's standing right, right here, Bob Jones, and he goes, yeah, God wants you to do the ship for dry. And I said, no, Bob, I'm not going to do that. And I, I, the reason I didn't get to tell him the reason I wasn't going to do that was I didn't want to do what somebody else was doing. I didn't want to copy anything, but I didn't get to tell Bob that. I said, no, Bob, I'm not going to do that. And he rubs his hands like that and goes, well, he wants you to, and off he goes. <laughs> just like that. And I'm standing there just beating myself up saying, good Lord. I didn't get to tell Bob why I wasn't going to do it. And Jesus appears right there. And he said, yes, I want you to do the shepherd drive. And I said, no, Lord, because I don't get revelation like that. When I said I don't get revelation like that, I was jerked up off earth. And carried up into the heavenlies into a big round dome of some sort. And the dome had screens. Thousands of screens like these right here all over. And every screen was playing a different sequel. A different prophetic sequel. And the moment my eyes would look at a screen, I'd know everything about it. The most minute detail about it. I'm thrown back down in front of Jesus, and he almost laughed at me and said, See, it's no problem for me to give you revelation. So for 29 years, on the Day of Atonement, I've had this visitation, and I've written about it in the book called Shepherd's Rod. Here's one right here. Uh, uh, th th listen, it's, it, I'm, I'll, I'll read the verse out of the Bible. It's out of Daniel. Say Daniel. Amen. Chapter 7, Chapter 7, verse 21 and 22. This is the whole, the whole crust of the shepherd's rod right here for 2023. 20, here it is. I kept looking. This is Daniel 7, 21 and 22. I kept looking that the horn was making war with the saints and the believers. The horn there means anything deadly and dangerous. It means Lucifer. It means uh, false prophets. It means uh, every deep, dark, devilish thing is under the horn there. And I kept looking, and that horn was making war with the saints, the believers, and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the Most High God. And the time, say the time, and the time arrived when the saints, the believers, took possession of the kingdom. The time has come. Now, that was for 20, uh, that was for 23. I just had 24. And God said, it's a sequel to 23. Here's what he said. He said, 24 is implementation of what this verse says. How to take back the kingdom. We're going to take back everything the devil's stolen. We're going to be bold and brave and very courageous. 
So you need to, you need to get Shepherd's Rod uh, 23, volume, 20, uh, volume 28, year 2003. I'm working on 2004. Woo! Uh, this is the second time it's ever happened. I'll tell you how this one happened. <clears throat> 90 days before the Day of Atonement, I was down in Texas just working away on some PowerPoints for some schools we were doing. And I'm, I was just having a, a good time there uh, in my office down there. And Holy Spirit shows up and says, Bobby, do you know the theme and the thrust for this year's Shepherd's Rod? It's 90 days away. It's not even on my chart. You know what I mean? And I said, no. And the Holy Spirit of God says, I do. And then he said like a little kid, do you want to know? I go, yeah. He said, the gavel of God and the verdict of God. I said, you're telling me the shepherd's rod is going to be the gavel of God and the verdict of God? What does that say? The gavel of God and the verdict of God's judgment? He said, yes, it is. So I was kind of cocky. I said, okay, what do you want me to do now? He said, I want you to type Google and type in the gavel of God and punch search. I typed in the gavel of God. I punched search. I like to fell out of my chair. Guess what popped up? Bobby Connor and the gavel of God back in 2008. I saw the Ancient of Days. Ancient of Days gave me a gavel. I struck an open Bible. And I put all of that in there. God said, I gave you that back there in 2008 for now. And boy, it's in here. I go, I go to the Ancient of Days, like to kill me, fire shot. The Ancient of Days is God in his robed majesty, his a flame of fire. Now, but you, you can read it in here. Oh, boy. These angels, warring angels came. They're, they're over 50 feet tall and fierce. Say fierce. fierce. You know, we got them down trying to sell toilet paper. That ain't the angels in the Bible. <laughs> These charming, you know, whatever that mess is. <laughs> These angels are fierce. And boy, I'll tell you what, uh, pr pretty wild. And here's what they were screaming. Can you read that word? Urgency. Divine urgency. That's his angels from heaven. They're screaming to me to scream to you. Divine urgency. Sound the alarm. Awake the warriors. Mobilize the church. That's what he says. And then now he said this is a critical hour. I quoted that verse a while ago, Romans 13, verse, Romans 13, 11 through 14, critical hour. Besides this, you know what a critical hour this is, how it's high time for us to wake up out of our sleep, rouse to reality for salvation, final deliverance is nearer to us now than when we first believed and hereto trusted in Christ the Messiah. The night is far gone, the day is almost here, let us then drop, fling away from us the deeds and the, the works of darkness and put on the full armor of light. Let us live and conduct ourselves honorably and becomingly as in the open light of day, not in reveling and carousing and drunkenness, nor in morality or debauchery, sensuality and lasciviousness, not in quarreling and jealousy, but clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus. If we're going to win this battle, we're going to have to become more like Jesus. I want us to be so much like Jesus that the devil can't tell whether it's Jesus or Bobby. Don't you think? That's when we're victorious. So you need to, you need to get shepherd's rod volume 23 to prepare you for shepherd's rod 24 i promise you shepherd's rod 24 is going to be implementation of everything this says for us to do i mean it shows you how i got swallowed by a glory cloud now you may think all of this is a joke a, a glory cloud came on the day of atonement and swallowed me i mean engulfed me i'm inside a glory cloud it's spinning like this revolution after revolution so fast with I'm screaming again but every revolution these they would be strategy cut on the wall of this glory cloud and it's going so fast so fast I said God I don't think I can maintain this he said no Bobby I'm not putting it in your mind I'm putting it in your spirit and so now this strategy I'm putting the strategy that he gave me from that glory cloud to prepare us for a shepherd's rod uh, 29 fulfilling this one right here wow don't you want to know what it is yes. we're, 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 we're going to number one it's going to all be about building and battling we're going to have to war and fight while we build and replace what the enemies tore down it's like in Nehemiah you read Nehemiah didn't you what do you do 
whatever you want to? Well, I'm semi-retired and I <laughs> yeah. work in a factory. So. That's good. That's good. So you've got plenty of time to build and battle. We've got to learn how to use the sword, the sword of the Spirit, and we've got to learn how to build. Number one thing the church needs to learn how to do is come together. The devil knows a house divided can't stand. Our nation can't stand because we're divided. And the devil knows that verse very well. And we've got to come together. And we've got to start esteeming one another more highly than ourselves. Okay? That's, this is all to get this done. We've got, we got a short time to get the kingdom back. Don't you think? That Bible said the devil's come down and he's fighting mad. Because he knows he's got a short period of time to work. But I tell you what, we're going to trot him under our feet. God says, I give you power, authority. I'm screaming, I give you power and authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And they'll in no wise hurt you. I was off on a cruise preaching. And the late, there was one of these where they had a motor on it. And I'd never seen one just, uh, and so I'm preaching. And there's a bunch of people up there in the seats. And I said, whose is this? And a little lady said, it's mine. I said, where's the keys? In my purse? I said, give them to me. And she said, okay. So she gave me the keys to her scooter. And I, I'm, I'm on a cruise, a preaching cruise. And I take off on her scooter. And it's pretty exhilarating. I mean, and start, I burnt, did, did several burnouts. This is all true. Several burnouts, and I'm mic'd up, and we're on a carnival cruise thing. And so I, I made two or three burnouts, and I took off down the aisle in, in the buggy and grabbed a woman's little baby and put him on my lap and drove out and went all the way down the ship. And I'm still preaching because they can hear me. You know, and we go all the way down the ship, turn this way, turn that way, and we come in that door there. Every deckhand they had was chasing me. They thought I'd kidnap the baby. You know. See, enjoy yourself. You ever hijacked a scooter and took a ride on a ship? Well, it's hard to forget about some of the things I've done. I rode a tricycle down the largest hill on Highway 31, being drugged by my buddy Chester, and we, we took a, a rope, a lasso rope, and put it around his sister's tricycle. And I'm standing on the back of the tricycle holding on to the handlebars, and the rope is tied to a strip down Lincoln. And I said to Chester, <laughs> make a circle. He makes me a circle like this two or three times. Then, you know, that's not enough. I scream, get out on the road. Out we go on Highway 31. Murray Hill, you can look it up, look it up in Google. It's the largest hill in that part of uh, East Texas, down Highway 31 between Brownsboro and Murkison. We pull out on there. Now, listen, uh, the tricycle's small, I'm big, and I'm not on the pedals, I'm on the back two where the tires are, and I got the handlebars, and we took off. He got me up to 82 miles an hour. You can't get off a tricycle at 82 miles an hour. <laughs> That's the way it was going, just like that. Oh, Lord. See, it was an adventure. Have you ever been on an 82-mile tricycle? See, what are you doing with your life? <clears throat> this is all true. I used to put my car on the railroad track, let air out of the tires, and drive over 120 miles an hour, not even touching the steering wheel. That's below moron. I, I don't think there's a category for where that was. Do you? There's idiot, moron, and then stupid. Put my car on the railroad track, let out a little bit of air, and it would suck around the... And just... Then I got to thinking... What would I have done if the Union Pacific was coming here? It's Bobby, hold it. But you don't even think about stuff like that, do you? You know, you, know, you just jump in for the ride. I did some crazy things. Here's one. They told me, that we want you to do a Bobby's bloopers. Boy, that'd be something. 
I had a gang called the Red Rats there in Texas, and so we were, you know, out of high school. And so we, we would go cow hopping. There in Texas, the cows go to sleep out in the pastures. They curl up, and we'd go out there and jump on the sleeping cows and ride them. It, you know, it, it was sort of like your own little redneck rodeo. So we run out there, and we jump on the cows, and they'll pitch and run and, and knock you off. Now, here's the thing. No, nobody in their right mind would do what I'm fixing to tell you. We'd go to this abandoned ranch to ride the cow hop, and there was an old well out beside the barn. And the guys, they'd all, we all rode the cows till we were tired. And it hit me. I said to myself, Seth, I'm going to jump in that well. Mm, don't know how deep it is. Don't know where it goes. Never looked in that well. And it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So I got up on the brick and I go, yeah. I jumped in the silly well. You talk about down, down, down. Kaloom. I go down, I go into water, I go under the water, I come back up. It's kind of exhilarating though, you know. <laughs> and I'm going, then it hit me. How am I going to get out? <laughs> My buddies are all messed up, you know. They don't know I'm down the bottom of a well. How'd you get there? I jumped in. Guess how I got out of the well? I frog hopped. Out of the well. <laughs> you cannot have a description of how sore you can get. <laughs> Frog hopping out of a well. I've been there and done that. I've done some exciting things. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know. We used to sit in the backyard and shoot cigarettes out of my, my brother and my mouth. With 22 rifles. My mother would come to the door. Swing the door open and holler. Hey you boys quit wasting them shells. They cost money. <laughs> yeah. That's how I was raised. Didn't say a thing about shooting Bobby in the head. Or Glenn in the nose. You know. <laughs> Y'all quit wasting. <laughs> but anyway we made it. I got some more books to talk about. Y'all go oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. Now here's what I want you to do. Get the Shepherd's Rod book. Uh, if you get a book, I'll sign it, give you a verse. There's a lot of good verses in the Bible. Here's one. The bed's too short. The cover's too narrow to get any rest like that. That's in the Bible for people trying to work at their own salvation. It'd be like me trying to sleep on that pulpit and cover up with this handkerchief. <laughs> bed's too short, cover's too narrow to get any rest like that. It means the futility of trying to save yourself. You understand that? That's in the Bible. Here's one. Here's one. Uh, I, I'll tell you the little story. It's about a young preacher, and he just started preaching, and he, he got all wound up, and he's kind of frail. He got all wound up, and he said, and the Bible says, and a heckler back there in the back says, I don't believe a word of that, and shut the little preacher down. Three times it happened. little preacher was kind of frail, and he got stirred up again. And the Bible said, and the heckler said, I don't believe a word of that. Three times it happened. So finally, the little preacher said to the heckler, Sir, would you come down here? Preacher's up there. And here comes the heckler. That's what he wanted. He's swaggering down there. There's the little preacher standing up here. And he looked at the heckler and said, Sir, come a little closer. Sir, uh, if I could get you to believe one verse, would you believe the rest of them? And the heckler looked up and said, Well, I guess I would. He said, Please come a little closer. And the heckler's right there, just right at him. And the little preacher reached out took the heckler by the nose, turned it this way, turned it that way, turned it this way, turned it that way, and let it go, and blood just shot everywhere. And little pastor quoted what it says in the book of uh, Proverbs. As sure as the churning of the milk brings forth butter, the wringing of the nose brings forth blood. <laughs> hey! That's in there. You better know some verses, don't you think? That's right. Guess what's fixing to happen? You're fixing to have the best night's sleep you've had in a long time. All right, you've been tormented not being able to sleep. That's over with, okay? The Bible said he'll lay his servants down and his sleep will be sweet, okay? No more night terrors, no more bad dreams, all right? 
That's a good thing. Sleep's wonderful. We all need that, don't you think? What is it you do? Retired. Oh, you retired. What'd you quit from? Everything. I still work. You still work? <laughs> I, I do a lot of marriage counseling. Here it is. There's two phrases. I do and yes, dear. <laughs> you missed that. Dr. Phil couldn't even help you. You know what I mean? That's true. I better get up here and preach. Y'all will think I'm just playing around. No, I'm sick and tired of sour Christians. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. He is through. Yea, they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'll fear no evil. Thou art what? With me. With me. So anyway, here, here, we're going to get down to some stuff. Say stuff. Stuff. Right, here's stuff. I got more hankies here. Looky there. I could sweat like a... I do. I sweat like a mad monkey, man. I got to find out about this guy back here. He's... What do you do? I'm actually an ordained minister. Are you? And I serve my wife. Oh, that's so good. You're smart. That's smart. That's really smart. That's right. She lets you get along with that? Yeah. It looks sort of like, uh, it looks nice. Okay. You, you, can, you can store some soup in there if you had to or yeah. something like that. Quite a goatee, don't you think? Uh Hello. You'll write a song one day. That's right. Words jump around in her head, and you'll write a song. Tell her to write it down, the words, and then God will put all that stuff together. Here's what's a stunner. Y'all are ready for a stunner? Now, remember, don't lie in church. Jesus Christ appeared to me and said, Bobby, yes, go where I tell you to go, okay? Do what I tell you to do when you get there. I will give the people an impartation whether they want it or not. What? Go where I tell you to go. Do what I tell you to do. When you get there, I'll give the people an impartation whether they want it or not. How can I tell them they can get it whether they want it or not? You get in the elevator with somebody contagious, you can be affected. Correct? Here's the impartation you're going to get tonight. You ready? Got a Bible? Hebrews 13, verse 20. And 21, now may the God of peace, who's the author and the giver of peace, who brought again from among the dead the Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood that sealed and ratified the everlasting agreement, the covenant, the testament. Verse 21 says, strengthen and complete and perfect you and make you what you ought to be and equip you with everything good that you may carry out his will while he himself works in you that which is accomplishing that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ the Messiah to whom be glory forever and ever ages without end. Amen. Amen. (laughs) Strengthen you, complete you, perfect you and make you what you ought to be and equip you with everything good that you may carry out his will while he himself carries out his will in your life. How many of you want that? So it says make you perfect. So I looked up make you perfect. Guess what it means? Missing no component. Have you ever tried to put something together with parts missing? Everything you need, God's giving you right there. That's Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 and 22. Ah, I like that, don't you? Let's look at that again. Strengthen, complete, perfect, and make you what you ought to be and equip you with everything good that you may carry out his will, God's will. While he, almighty God, works in you, accomplishing that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ the Messiah, to whom be glory forever and ever, ages without end. Amen. Don't you want it? See, he said you're going to get it whether you want it or not. Now then, you're going to be responsible for it. You believe in the anointing, don't you? Romans 1, 11 and 12, it says, I yearn to be with you that I might impart to you a spiritual enabling. God would be unjust to give us a touch a touch and a task without a touch, don't you think? All right, so what do you do? Unemployed. What? Unemployed. Unemployed. Yeah, okay. Do you want a job? I can pray and ask God to give you a job, and he'll give you a job. This is true. The Bible said we have not because we ask not. Ask and you shall receive, seek, you shall find, knock. It'll be open for you. Let me ask you this. If God just opened up a good job, would you be honest and open with him? Okay. 
it'd be awful to get you in a nice place and you'd be, the Bible said, will a man rob God? <laughs> yes, you've robbed me. How? Tithes and offerings. Right. Put us under a curse. I saw prophets riding Balaam's donkey backwards. I said, God, what's that? He said, it's prophets riding Balaam's donkey backwards. <laughs> Remember like Balaam couldn't bless. And we can't, a prophet can't bless what God's cursed. You understand that? That's what happened. So anyway, I, you want a job? So we're just going to pray for you, okay? What's your first name? Josh. Josh. Lord Jesus, you know, you know everything about Josh. You know all, every hair on his head, every thought in his mind, every purpose in his heart. He's wanting a job. I ask you, Lord Jesus, open the job that you've set aside for him. And Lord, do it in such a way he realizes it's you. It's you and I pray it will be a great stepping stone of surrender to you from his life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good. Now listen, that, it'll be good. God does over and above anything we could ask or dare to imagine. Is that correct? Jesus walked up to me one time. Here's what he said. You ready? I give you my personal permission to attempt to exaggerate what I'm about to do. I said to him, I'm going to need a verse for that. He said to me, no problem, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him that's able to do what? Exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or dare to imagine. So we've got to start imagining bigger things, don't you think? Ask of me and I'll give you the nations. Yeah. We've got to take the lids of limitation off, don't you think? Uh, Genesis, uh, it says, Genesis 18, 14, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Job 42, 2 says, God, I know anything you set your heart and your hand to do cannot be stopped. So the question was, is anything too hard for God? Answer is nope. Job 42, 2, anything you had set your hand, your heart to do cannot be stopped. Isn't that something? Well, that's good. He's going, oh, man, I hope he don't say nothing to me. <clears throat> Too late for that. Okay? Here's, here's the deal. You say, I don't believe God speaks like that. Here's what's going to happen to you. God's going to give you a dream. It'll be so real and so vivid. From that moment on, you'll believe that God says what he means and means what he says. Okay, and it'll be good. Here's what it says in the Bible. I spoke to you and spoke to you. you. You didn't even think it was me, so I'll seal what I'm saying in a dream, okay? And that'll be a good thing. Honestly, you get your confirmation from a God-given dream. It's very, very substantial, and it, 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 you know you didn't come up with it, okay? So don't you, that'll be good. So you'll get a dream, and it'll give you some insights and information about what you're looking for, okay? And you won't have to just kind of make it up. God knows all about us, knows every hair on our head, knows every evil thing we've ever done, and still loves us. Your friends won't. They can find some dirt on you. They'll distance themselves. But when God sees you struggling, he draws near, doesn't he? He's a friend that does what? Sticks closer than a brother. What do you do? Oh, you're writing tongues. No. <laughs> no, no. Oh, I like this guy. God bless you. I mean that. God bless you. Okay? We're never too old. You know what? My next birthday, in November the 29th, I'll be 80 years old. I'm going to, go, I'm going to be preaching when I'm 120. There's a verse in the Bible that says, you can live as long as you want to. I'll tell you what it says, but I'll never tell you where it's at. You'll have to search for it. See, the Bible said, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter of the honor of kings to search it out. Don't, you, don't, understand, don't misunderstand. God has secrets. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29 and 29 said the secret things belong unto the Lord, but the things are revealed belong unto us and to our descendants from now on. So look in the Bible and see what's revealed and you can take it. Deuteronomy 29, 29. This means yes, unless you're... <laughs> huh? Okay. Some of you are going, oh man, he's hard to keep up with. Oh, listen. I didn't even talk about my school days. Blew up the science lab. I did. We had a whole bunch of money then because the oil field came in through uh, East Texas. and So they built a big old aquarium in the science lab. I mean, it was this tall and at least as long as this. And it's full of exotic fish and stuff. <clears throat> Back then... You could get in the river, the creek, and take an old one of these crank telephones, 
run the wires down there and strip the wires back and crank it up, and it would electrocute the fish, and they'd come up. And you could just, it was illegal, but, you know, it's shocking, you know. Okay. So I'm in school, and the school science teacher is Mr. Guatney. All you saw was his back. He's always writing on the board. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm there, and I got to looking at the aquarium. All these thousands and thousands of dollars worth of fish. And I got to thinking about the boat and he dropped the wire down in front of him. And I looked and there on my desk was a, a extension cord. And so I thought, okay, I don't have a crank phone, but I got a light socket here. So I cut the wires off. I cut about 18 inches down and I dropped the wires over in the tank and plugged her in. I don't know exactly the word to say, but something like it's vibration and a whole bunch of those words. Boom, 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 boom. It's four or five. Boom, 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 boom. Blew the sides out. There's high dollar fish just flopping. Now, if you ever do something like that, don't have the extension cord stuck in your desk. Plug it in your buddy's stuff. But anyway. So that's how I blew up the science lab. Yeah. Then we turned a whole truckload of stolen chickens loose in the school. Yeah. The, see, Friday night in little towns, you've got to do something. After Friday night football. So I had my gang. Friday night football's over. What are you going to do? I don't know. Let's steal some chickens. Back in Texas, there the chickens sleep in a tree with the head under the wing, like some people in church. You know, like they figure if they can cover up, the world just go by. And chickens are easy to steal; they're they're just kind of dumb. You go up the tree and grab one, throw it in the sack. Bark, bark! It's a foul thing. Bark, bark! So we stole a big truckload of chickens. About three o'clock in the morning. It's about to get daylight. Late, it's well, we started Friday night and it's just about to get daylight on Saturday. And then we thought, somebody came up with this weird question What are we going to do with the chickens? <laughs> and somebody said, Let's put them in the school. <laughs> this is late uh, Friday night. Now, I'm not taking all the blame for this. You'd have thought they'd lock the door, wouldn't you? They're supposed to be responsible. I go to the front door where it was locked, over there to the study hall door, whoosh, back in the trucks, boy. We, we unloaded a, a big truckload of stolen chickens and shut them in. Now, let me tell you, should that ever happen to you, vacuum your truck. Because <laughs> here's what happened. The chickens... We're in there all Friday night, all, all Friday, all Saturday, all Sunday, then Monday, Monday. Oh, you've, they, they went nuts, the people, the teachers. I don't have verbs to say how big a mess a truckload of chickens can make in school, but it's awful. I mean... <laughs> So anyway, here's what happened. There's my truck full of chicken feathers. So for we'd have to come to school two hours early. They put us in hazmat, had, looked like something made of an alien movie. And we had to scrub the school with some rubber gloves on and something about the size of a toothbrush, scrub the whole school. And then we'd have to do the football practice, come back in, and another four hours of scrubbing. You know, when you turn them loose, it's kind of fun, but picking up the mess. Yeah, but anyway, that's what I'm famous for in the school. <laughs> I tell them school got my way of having fun. My drama teacher, here's what she wrote in my, bi my, not my Bible, my, my graduation book. They had to mail it to me. I was incarcerated, but anyway, this is all true. Here's, here's what she wrote in my yearbook. You ready? Miss Ellis. Yeah, ready. It's your fault. I had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> That's what she said. Now, if I hadn't have been the kind of man I am, that could have warped me. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> oh, Lord. You know, they talk about the chickens coming back to roost, so to speak. We, 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 I'll get through the school. In a, my wife just hates this part, but I like to just show who we are. Enjoy yourself. Well, you know, you know, you know I'm more kind of, well, I'm, I'm kind of, well, you're bashful. God don't want us to be bashful. See, well, I'm, I'm not a very outgoing person. Well, you're probably backslidden and a coward. The Bible said the righteous will be what? Bold as a lion. And the church is going, meow, meow. Hey, we better start soaring, soaring, roar. Meow. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've got some stories, man. My wife says, why do you tell those stories? Well, just to get your attention. If God will use me, you've got a shot. Don't you think? <laughs> the judge that used to lock me up bought me my first preaching suit, Judge Winston Reagan. Now, he came to me later and said, Preacher, do you know why I bought you that suit? I said, No, sir, I don't. I certainly appreciate it. He said, Now, I'm a Methodist, and Methodists don't talk like this. He said, A boss came to me and spoke to me and told me to buy you that suit. So he bought me my first preaching suit. Yes, he did. When I first started preaching, the first few rows would be policemen. This is true. Uh-huh. But the Lord loves me, and I, I have a good time. He told me one time, he said, you amuse me, boy. Jesus appeared to me right like that, and he said, I want you to study Song of Solomon. Guess what came out of my mouth? I don't get nothing out of that book. Now, that's about as dumb as you can get. <laughs> Jesus is the word, and he tells you to study Song of Solomon. And I said, I don't get nothing out of that book, so help me, God. The next, verse out, the next word out of Jesus' mouth was, you don't know the, nothing about kissing, do you, boy? I said, apparently not. And he said, to mouth kiss, Jesus Christ told me, he said, to mouth kiss, you had to be face to face. Number two, you had to be really close. Number three, mouth kissing is the most stimulating preparatory act before intimacy. Then he said, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth because his mouth is altogether lovely. That's in the Song of Solomon. Study it. Another verse you better study in the Song of Solomon. Who is this? Coming up out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved. The church is going to get with Jesus and they're going to be such a makeover, we won't even recognize ourselves. Who is this? Coming up out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved. He alerted us down there to teach us how to trust him. Song of Solomon. It's a strong book. Anyway, so we got to go. I'm going to have a book signing back there for anybody who wants one of those books. And I'll write you a verse, not the one about churning milk and spurting blood. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll write you a verse that has some content to it. Okay? There, there's some great verses in there. Here's one, Psalm 65, 11. He crowns this year with his goodness, and everywhere his chariot wheels roll, it drips with fatness or plenty. You won't get that from... Lying Lester on the news, will you? No, you won't. He crowns this year with his goodness. God wants us to see his goodness. He's a good, good God, isn't he? And he's very, very benevolent to us. Matter of fact, it says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness nor shadow of turning. What in the heck does that mean? No variableness nor shadow of turning. Here's what it means. You ready? God ain't fickled. Our culture is continuing trying to change. Under, uh, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness nor shadow of turning. He's not fickled. The Bible said forever, O God. Thy word is what? Settled. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will what? Stand. So that's good. So you're doing good? I, I didn't know you could sing like that. Now, they never let me sing, but when I do sing, I sing like Louis Armstrong. La, la, darling, you're looking swell. See? I love it. Uh, see, our, I know. Okay. That's a dead ringer for Louis. But I don't think there's much demand for Louis myself, but uh, I amuse myself. <laughs> Quit. Be, start enjoying yourself. What do, you, what do you do back there? Yes. What? Food, food service? I'm your man. <laughs> Listen, I could tell you, I go all over the world, there's some stuff out there that, whoo, meow, woof, woof. 
You can't hardly put enough sauce on that. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> but he says he's going to bless the works of your hands because of your heart. Wow. Establish thou the works of my hands. Oh God, the works of my hands establish thou it. And let your glorious majesty be seen by our children. That's Psalms 90, verse 16 and verse 17. Okay? He's going to bless the works of your hands. Establish thou the works of his hands. And then it says, let your glorious majesty be seen by our children. But he's seen your heart and he's going, to, he's going to upgrade you. Okay? That's good. Don't you want the favor of God? The Bible said, the anger of the Lord is, the anger of the Lord is for a tiny moment. I think, I guess, the anger of the Lord is but for a brief tiny moment, but his favor is for a whole lifetime. It says in Isaiah 520, the, the weeping lasts through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Don't you want to be happy? Yes. Yeah. It's good. I'll walk back here and see how this crowd's going. <laughs> you can't outrun me. I'll just chase you down, you know. <laughs> well, that's good. Everything okay? Good. Uh, all right. A lot of stuff to talk about, but I'm ready to go home and take a nap. <laughs> and maybe a snack before bedtime. You like snacks? Yes, I do. I'm a snacker. I'm, I'm beginning to be a professional napper. Yeah. You know, people, I can't sleep. Shut your eyes. <laughs> you know. Unplug something, you know. You can't watch uh, Wheel of Fortune and go to sleep. You know what I mean? Anyway, I've had fun. We're going to be here tomorrow. I don't know when. If I don't hush, it'll be tomorrow. But see, I, I've been up all day and all that and had two cups of coffee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't need that monster stuff, you know. I, it just, you know, uh, tap water works for me, you know. I want us to be energetic, don't you? Yes. Well, brother, quit being cynical and sour. Smile. And look at yourself and go, wow, I'm really something. There's nobody like me. You're one in 7.6 billion, give or take a few. And ain't nobody else like you. Boy, that's unique, isn't it? That's good. Have you ever thought about playing a flute? Yeah. That's what I think. There's a flute music in the tips of your fingers. She says, what about me? Yeah. All right. We're back here. I've never seen so many good looking. And look at mine. What do you do? Uh, we manage our own residential property. We manage your own residential property. I don't know quite what that is. Mow the grass! Okay, that's yeah, <laughs> something like that. Doesn't, don't, that fits right in, doesn't it? What do you do? A retired man. What'd you quit from? Irrigation. <laughs> here it is. Irrigation. Irrigation. Yeah. Well, here's your verse. It's in the Bible. It says, one generation will spend the rest of their time <laughs> lauding and applauding the mighty deeds of God, convincing the coming generation God's everything he says he is. So that's what you'll do. You'll laud and applaud the mighty deeds of God, telling them how faithful it is to get the younger generation to believe that God's everything he says he is. That's Psalms 146. We got to get out of here. It's getting late. I'm going to the book room. Let's see. I ought, to, I ought to just pray for you a moment. Here, here's, the, here's the number one prayer I get. Can you tell me how to memorize the Bible? The number one question I get asked is, how do you memorize the Bible? Here's what the Bible says. God didn't give us the spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. We don't get a certain age, and we don't know whether we're at bingo or bowling. God will give you a sound mind, a mind that can catalog and retain facts. And so I'll pray for you that to happen to you. You want it? where you can study the Bible and you, you can be able to pull it up. Father, in Jesus' name, we release a, a retention right now, spiritual retention when they study the Word of God. Help them to hide it in your heart. In their heart, you said, put your Word in our heart. And Lord, I'm asking you to give them retention of Bible verses and help them to study to show this up approved unto God, a workman that does not have to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God. So Lord, teach us to study your Word. You said, my people are perishing for a lack of knowledge. Help us, God, to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that doesn't have to be ashamed, 
Teach us the word of God and the ways of God. Here's your great verse, Psalms 100. Psalms 119, verse 130. The entrance of your word, the penetration of your word gives light. It gives me a grasp and a comprehension of the ways and the works of God. Okay? So if you get a book, I'll sign a verse in there. And uh, we've seen miracles happen. God grew a guy a finger. Uh, here, here's one that's pretty, pretty exciting, I think. Uh, a, a real sweet little black grandmother she comes up to get a book. And behind her is her uh, granddaughter. And there's Granny. She's solid as a brick. And here's the granddaughter. She's, like, she's behind Granny like, let's get out of here. Let's blow this place. And let's... Anyway. So anyway, I, I looked at Granny and I said, that's your granddaughter. And said, yes. I said, I got a word for her. Okay. What is the word? And uh, I said, She's going to one day have her face on a magazine uh, where they sell makeup. And then she quit that and she goes, and guess what happened? About three months later, her granny and the girl comes back and her face is on one of these cosmopolitan magazines. They'd hired her to be a makeup uh, for wearing makeup. And see, it turned their whole family to the Lord over giving a word like that. Isn't that cool? See, I may give you a word if you come by. You say, well, I need one. We all do. We need to hear a clear word. The Bible said, if you receive a prophet, the name of a prophet, you'll get a prophet's reward. I don't know about you, but what the heck is that? I'll tell you what it is. You ready? A prophet's reward is the deepest desire of your heart granted by the power of God. Where is it at? The Shunammite woman. I perceive this as a mighty man of God that continues to pass by our house. Let's make a little room for him. Isn't that right? And she got what she asked for, didn't she? Yes, I'm getting all this stuff together. <clears throat> Nobody knows. Look at here. This is nice. Don't you like this church? I like this church. There's a genuineness about the church. The pastor, he's genuine. The pastor's wife is genuine. The sons and daughters are genuine. Don't be a fake. Just be you. Just be you. You go, well, my nose is big. Be thankful you got a nose. Okay? Start bragging on God for making you. We're wonderfully and fearfully made. That's what it says. We're knit together in the secret place. I stayed awake during operation just to see how it looked. Because I was studying about we're wonderfully and fearfully knit, knit together. So I, I wouldn't go under unconscious, stayed awake while they did some inside work to study about us being knit together. We're, yeah. The doctor said, we'll have to put you to sleep. I said, no, I ain't going to sleep. He said, well, we can't do it. I said, we can't do it. He said, you're serious. I said, I'm serious. Stay wide awake. You know, yeah. You can push pain away. You can put it in the back pocket, you know. Anyway, I got my water. I'm going to the book signing thing. And uh, pastor will close out. Everything will be okay. Y'all will come back next month. No, no, it's tomorrow. Yeah. Anybody that has a blood disorder, if you'll stand to your feet, the Lord Jesus Christ will cure you and heal you of your blood disorder. I don't care if it's from a, a fallen liver or whatever. If you've got a blood disorder, stand to your feet. Lord Jesus, you just spoke to me and said you're going to heal blood disorders. And he says your bones are going to wax fat. Ask your doctor about that. Medi there's a healing comes when God says, your bones will wax fat. Lord Jesus, these men and women are standing because you've promised you're going to heal them. And I'm asking you right now, Lord Jesus, do it in such a way you get great glory. I pray that they'll be able to be confirmed and confirmed and everybody will know Jesus does what he says. So Lord, we thank you for healing blood disorder, straightening out livers, and just make us ever with whole completely well in Jesus name all right God bless you I better turn this mic off I might give the Remember the movie? Uh, Lulu Roman, remember her? I had her come to one of my crusades. Lulu, Lulu Roman. Guess what she was? Uh, she was a stripper and they paid her by the pound. 
What? 300 pound gal. Lulu, uh, and, and so she got born again. And I invited her to, I was doing a stadium, a football stadium. I invited her to come give her testimony. There she'd been a stripper, being paid by the pound. And there she now is preaching the gospel about Jesus. Hey, see? That's true. All right, so tomorrow night he's going to do a time of laying on of hands, an impartation to pray for you. So let's be in prayer. I think God's going to move powerfully tomorrow night. And uh, let's, let's just stand up. We're going to dismiss. I need the ministry team to come up here as well. If you feel like you need breakthrough, we want to make sure that you leave uh, tonight with anything that you came for. So we have people that have been seeking the Lord. They're ready to pray for you. And uh, if you want prayer for breakthrough, you want to break open in the prophetic or some flow of the Spirit, I'd like you to take and come forward and let God touch you. Amen? Father, we pray that you'd, dis- you'd uh, be with them as they leave. And we pray, Father, that, that you would continue to move on them and let them come into deeper things in you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. Feel free to come forward for prayer.